Okay, so Jeff and Blaze, why don't you guys just start out by introducing yourselves? Go ahead, Blaze, Jeff. you go. Blaze, yeah. you go <laughs> first. You guys are too generous. To each other. <laughs> Who's going first? Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I'm uh, Blaze Cruz. Uh, I'm a Toronto policeman. I work at the 43 Division. Uh, currently, uh, back in uh, primary response uh, on C platoon. Um, and uh, we're here to tell you about our program, our, uh, our passion in our life. Your baby. I um, love that. Jeff, who are you? Yeah, I'm Jeff Dowding. I'm also at 43 Division on B Platoon. Uh, Blaze and I previously worked in the Community Response Unit, which is where we started the ball rolling for this whole program. And our uh, careers have moved on from that unit, so but we're keeping it going. We don't want to see this thing fizzle out. Awesome. Okay. So I'm, I'm excited to jump right into this first, uh, for anybody who's listening and doesn't know what like primary response is, essentially you guys are responding to 911 calls, right? Somebody calls 911. If there's police required, you guys are just going from call to call. Is that right? Is that fair to fair to 911 calls and everything in between mm. all the, the, uh, your regular everyday calls to, uh, you know, uh, somebody has something taken from their house or they're having a dispute with their neighbor. All right. So um, before we reveal what this program is, I want to ask you a question, Blaze, because I found this really interesting when we spoke on the phone a week or two ago. Tell me the reason that you wanted to be a police officer. So if I'm being full, frank and fair, um, I wanted to be a police officer because I wanted to drive fast, look cool, and catch bad guys. And was that and, since uh, you were a little boy, or when did the, that develop? So I, I'm, uh, I work in Scarborough now. Uh, interesting uh, fun fact about me, I'm 46 years old. Um, I grew up in Scarborough from, I moved to Scarborough but when I was 12 years old, and I've never had a job outside of Scarborough. Okay, So every single job that I've ever had was within the boundaries of Scarborough. And um, it's just one of those things. Um, so it, I don't even know how to explain it. It's there, there's, there's even a lot of passion behind that. Mm. So. so tell me about that. Now, now that you mentioned it, tell me where does that passion come from? Um, so I grew up uh, pretty, I, I, I feel like I can relate to a lot of the people that I, that I serve, right? Um, I grew up uh, in Malvern. Um, we didn't have much money, um, which is kind of interesting on how I got into the racing and all that other stuff uh, where it all started uh, because I didn't really have the money or, or and my parents didn't have the money to fund it either. Mm. Right? So, yeah, that's, that's a really, uh, that's, that's a really, our... it sounds like a really expensive thing to be interested in fast cars. So how did you, and Jeff, don't worry, I'm going to get to you. Cause I want to get dive right into your mm -hmm. story, but how did you then blaze? Like, where did it come from? This were this passion for cars. So in high school, I start high school at 14 and I start taking shop classes. Um, and, uh, and I really hit it off with one of my teachers, um, Mr. Huggett. He, uh, he was, uh, he was kind of a mentor to me. We became uh, actually really close and, uh, and good friends. Um, and I always tell this in our program. Uh, and so, uh, in that class, I met several other kids, um, not kids anymore, but kids at the time, um, that were, uh, were interested in the same things as me, right? We, uh, we like fast cars. We like cars that were, uh, were, you know, uh, modified and, and what have you. And, uh, and the, I always put this in our program uh, and I always tell people, uh, uh, life lesson number one to me, uh, in grade 11, I finished grade 11 and went off for my summer, uh, summer break. And, uh, Mr. Huggett passed away in the, uh, in that summer. And, uh, so it was a big blow to me. Um, uh, I go back in September and I didn't talk to him for a few weeks and, uh, you know, back then it wasn't, you weren't connected as much. Uh, you had to call home. Uh, when you wanted to talk to somebody, uh, we didn't have text messages in that. And, uh, so unfortunately I lost him in, uh, but I did have three good years with him and that's where it all started. Um, and we, uh, 
we started doing all the silly stuff uh, on the street. Um, and I'm, I'm very open about what I did and, and how I did it as much as I'm a policeman now. Um, I did things that I probably shouldn't have been doing uh, with the cars when I was younger. So what were you doing? I was street racing. Um, my parents had no idea. I was, uh, by the time I was 19 years old, I had a car that, uh, that I was working on uh, that was probably making somewhere in around five, 600 horsepower for the time. It was a lot. Um, nowadays, you know, your car is kind of, your Honda Civic comes with 300 now. So it's, uh, it's changed. But um, so by the time I'm 19 years old, I'm, uh, I'm out on the streets until six o'clock in the morning racing uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, uh, and I had one accident. Uh, I had one accident, uh, minor, thank goodness. Um, and then uh, a few close calls. Hmm. Um, shortly after, I started working for, um, for a place called Phoenix Performance. Mm -hmm. They built drag cars. Uh, we built drag car chassis and, uh, and roll cages and what have you. And that's where it kind of took a different turn where I was watching these guys that were older than me racing at the track. Right. Mm. And, uh, and I, the, the street racing kind of slowed down at first and then stopped. What, what happened with your accident? Who's, whose car were you in first? <laughs> I was in my dad's car. So this is, uh, this is one thing I, I tell the kids, uh, all the time, um, or the youth that I, we work with all the time. You don't need to be in a race car, uh, to get hurt. Um, uh, the, uh, my dad's car was, uh, uh, an 87 Plymouth Sundance. It wasn't powerful, but I still lost control of it and I smacked it into a curb and uh, did a lot of damage to it. Mm. Um, the He was not at impressed. Yeah, no kidding. What, that's, what that's was that conversation like after? <laughs> did did he understand how uh, this happened was, that you'd been racing? It was pretty tense. It was pretty tense. <laughs> so, he, uh, did he know and, that you'd uh, been into one, street and, racing? Did he know that you'd been no, into street racing? No, so my parents no? didn't know. My parents had no idea I was doing this. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons uh, this whole thing kind of took place is because uh, now I have teenage boys, uh, 15 and 17. And, uh, and here's where it takes a turn, right? So now you start thinking, man, I hope they don't do what I did. And, um, and, and then to add to that, um, not only I hope they don't do what I did is my kids grew up around fast cars um, because I've been into this my whole life. Right. So they grew up at the racetrack uh, watching my friends race. Uh, we, we, we were going when they were babies. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so they think it's even cooler uh, than the other kids. Right. So I'm, now I'm thinking to myself, man, like my son is talking about a thousand horsepower, like, uh, like he's going around the corner or driving around in a Civic, mm. right? And uh, so it's it's you know it makes uh, makes you think and uh, and I and I really have been I really have been dreaming about this my whole career, uh, mm. just about seventeen years in, mm. and uh, and I I didn't know where to start this um, a year ago. Uh, it was it was uh, it started with a, a Google search. Mm. Um, and me not even knowing which direction to take it in. And, uh, what, and what, did, what were you Googling? Online. What were you Googling? Um, like street racing programs with police officers, uh, uh, taking your car to the track with officers. It actually, uh, I actually saw something on um, NHRA. Um, so it, it, one thing I like to get into too is, uh, so NHRA, the way it started, that's the sanctioning body for, for drag racing. Okay. Uh, National Hot Rod Association. Um, so they, their whole thing to this day is uh, is not to street race because the way the NHRA started was uh, uh, in the fifties or something when uh, when everybody was street when it started street racing. Um, they created this sanctioning body to so you could have a place to take your car and and race. And, um, and I, I forget the name of the program, but they still have it to this day mm. where, uh, uh, you can go with your, with your teenager and 
let them drive on a track and you can actually sit there beside them and instruct them, which is, they're kind of almost uh, bending the rules uh, for themselves, uh, their own rules, because in a race car, you're, they won't ever let you put any uh, passenger mm-hmm. in. It's just a, a, a no-no. Um, but they're, uh, they, they still run these programs to this day at, at any track that is sanctioned by, uh, by the NHR. Hmm. Okay, so I, I want to pause there before we totally get into the program. We're still sort of teasing it a little bit because we haven't said exactly what the program is. But first, I want to get to you, Jeff. Jeff, how did you get into, like, where did your love of cars come from? It all started in high school. I mean, as a kid, um, I didn't have any family or friends that were into cars, really, um, other than, you know, watching the shows on TV. But uh, when I went to high school, I met a group of friends who were all really into cars and that just, you know, set it off for me. So um, it got me really excited. Uh, When I was in high school, a good friend of mine, he bought an old classic car and we spent a couple of years fixing it up. Mm. Um, And that car actually did see some street racing. I wasn't driving. and then Sorry, just, just, you just cut out there for a second, Jeff, you weren't driving. You said when, when it was street. No, racing? I, no, I was just helped them build the car. We went to watch sometimes, but, uh, we were certainly around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I went away to college for tool and die making. And then I bought a car of my own, an old mm-hmm. car. And I've been fixing it up ever since and go to the strip every once in a while, but Luckily for me, when I had the car, uh, I was old enough, mature enough that I didn't actually do the street racing myself. Okay. So you guys, you guys make a really interesting team then, but I need to stop and ask you something. You said you went to college for tool and die making. So how did you go from that to policing? Uh, I was looking for a job with a little more excitement, a little more variety. Okay. So are you, would you agree with like the fast cars? Were you wanting to look cool and be in fast cars too? Or was it a little bit different than Blaze? Well, I remember going to work one day, stopped a, a, the intersection got shut down by a police officer who waved about uh, five other police cars going lights and sirens through the intersection. I'm sitting there in my car driving to, driving to work. I'm like, like, that looks a lot more exciting than what I'm doing now, staying at a machine all day for mm-hmm. 14 hours a day in a cave with no windows. Mm-hmm. No kidding. So I wonder then, and I want to ask both of you this, and I swear we're going to get back to your program, but um, Jeff, I'll start with you just because we're already chatting about it. Then when you actually became a police officer, was it what you expected it to be or was there anything that surprised you about it? Um. Yeah, it was pretty much what I expected for the good and the bad. Mm. Um, you had an idea beforehand? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of politics involved, mm. which is unfortunate. But uh, yeah, I'm glad I made the, the switch. I did work in tool and die making for I don't know, eight years or something. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, I think that helped me appreciate the job a lot more. Mm. Interesting. Uh, and what about you, Blaze? Like, was it, there must have been things that surprised you about the job. If, if your dream as a child growing up was to look cool and drive fast cars, what, what did you think of policing when you actually started it? Um, I had a lot of fun, but then at the same time, I thought to myself, man, how come there's so much paperwork? Because, <laughs> I mean, I used to watch Lethal Weapon and uh, Danny Glover and, uh, and Mel Gibson would blow up a whole block and uh, they'd be back out on patrol four hours later. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the members of the general but, public, yeah, I don't I, think most people don't understand just how many hours you guys spend on paperwork after something happens. Like mm-hmm. that there's, I imagine there's a lot of overtime involved in that. And, and, you know, in Toronto, we're, we're very lucky in a sense, because um, for instance, yesterday uh, I had a 12 hour shift. Um, and out of that 12 hour shift, I only got the three calls, um, mm. because the first call was a biggie. 
we ended up uh, arresting, charging someone, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, after a few hours, we're back out on the road, mm -hmm. right? But without our support units, um, you know, uh, we had several units that stopped off uh, from the neighborhood officers from that area uh, to uh, uh, our CISU officers that are uh, that came to take pictures and video and seize video and what have you. Mm. Um, it, it that that got got us through that uh, call really quickly. And then when we got to the station, um, I'm dropping the paper off for our, uh, for our criminal investigations office, right? And our detectives are taking the case over, so I didn't have to do the case. Um, you know, somewhere else. I probably would have been down for um, at least seven, eight hours, wow. um, but we were able to get through it in, in probably two and a half, three. And then, you know, it just so happened that my day yesterday was one of those days where uh, a 12 hour shift was three calls mm. um, because they were all big calls. Mm -hmm. um, but without the support units, uh, the first one would have been the whole day, mm. right, essentially. Yeah. That's really interesting to think about. Okay. So this program, we started talking about your Googling last year, Blaze. Uh, where did it go from there? You, you essentially, you wanted to do something with kids to keep them off the streets and on the track essentially. Right. So where did your Googling take you? So, uh, it took me two places. Uh, several places actually they have a, a program down in uh, Sonoma California uh, they also have one in Phoenix Arizona where they work with high school kids and um, but then the biggie for me was uh, when I found uh, Blue Line Racing uh, out in Edmonton and, um, and, and that one was kind of hit home because I'm like well hang on these guys are Canadian mm. and then I go onto their website and I read up on them in, under their community um, uh, drop down in on uh, on the Edmonton website on the Edmonton Police website, and shortly realized that they've been running this program since 1997. Wow! Um, so that went from uh, me uh, reading up on their website and and sending out a couple of uh, emails to them, mm -hmm. um, and that was shortly uh, shortly contacted by a couple of the uh, the the members of, of that program. And, uh, and we talked and, you know, um, I, I, the, the main founder of the, uh, the actual program, uh, and, uh, it, his, I know his first name is Mike, but I, I he's got kind of a, a, a longer last name and I, I, it's not coming to me right now, but, um, he, uh, he called me and we talked on the phone for a couple minutes and it was quite, quite funny because he's got a, a passion behind his program, uh, the Blue Line Racing program, and uh, and the first thing he asked me is, so what uh, what you know how, how are you involved with cars? What what do you do, right? Mm -hmm. And before he even uh, before we even talked about anything else, really, and uh, and looking back now, he was absolutely right because um, the passion behind this full program with Jeff and I is uh, is, is 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 pretty big, right? And, uh, and both Jeff and I feel like, uh, like we're giving back to that, that car community. And then at the same time, we're also hoping to build the bridges between, you know, the, uh, the Toronto police service and, uh, and, and the community, mm -hmm. the car community, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Blaze, I know, um, that you had your close calls, like when you were street racing, you had that, that one collision and a couple other close calls. Um, Jeff, you said that you didn't actually, you were old enough, you were mature enough by the time you got into this, that you didn't actually get into the street racing. So what made you want to, you know, what, where does your passion come from for keeping kids from getting into street racing? What, what is it that drives you? No pun intended, or maybe pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> well, with my car, I took it to the track. Um, and I just want to see that kind of mentality in the next generation. You see on TV, um, like in the news, uh, you know, they're shutting down intersections, doing donuts and burnouts and uh, street racing and everything. And people are getting hurt. And that gives me a bad name. Like, it, I, I don't like it when I get painted with that same brush, right? 
as a so, car person. As, as a car person. Exactly. Right? It, it attaches a stigma so, to it. If you're passionate about fast cars, then you must also be reckless. I guess that would be the stigma, right? Exactly. Exactly. And putting other people's so, yeah, lives just, at risk. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that the message of ticket to the track gets passed on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, have fun. You can so, have, you can, there, there's safe legal alternatives to street racing. So we're here to, to share that. Do you guys think that like people who are out there street racing, let's say like 18, 19 year old guys, just throwing it out there. Do you think that they're unaware that there's a safer way that they can be doing this? Or do you think that they know, and they're, they're taking it to the street instead as a way of saying, you know, screw you or screw the rules being rebellious well i'm sure with, with street racing there comes a certain thrill to to knowing it's illegal and that type of crowd we're probably not going to reach but the people that don't realize just how severe the consequences are mm -hmm. i think that's the crowd that we can reach and show them get them back on the right path mm -hmm. you know, take it to the track. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. This is, this is the reason, this is the reason we started working with the, uh, with the high schools, uh, students is, and, and I always tell them, um, we are not at the high schools and talking to, you know, uh, 16, 17, 18 year olds because we're picking on them. Uh, that is not the case. The reason, uh, for me, uh, um, and I, I can probably speak for Jeff here too, is because they're not they are not likely to be out doing that stuff yet mm -hmm. and i should hope that if i show them uh the case studies the uh the way to do it properly uh, they can take it uh to a, a different level uh instead of instead of going down the wrong path uh go on the right path mm -hmm. from the start so let's let's jump into this program then uh what's it called what do you guys do? What are you hoping to accomplish? So the, the program is called Right Track Racing, um, kind of a double meaning. Um, we, uh, we essentially uh, have a, an hour long presentation and a PowerPoint uh, that Jeff actually put together. Um, as much as I had, I, I like to say that I had input on it and some of the videos in there and what have you are, are were my ideas and, Jeff, I, and Jeff's ideas, but He's the one that worked hard on it, and that not, and he gets full credit for that because it, he's done a very good, uh, well put together presentation. Mm -hmm. So we present uh, to uh, grade eleven, grade twelves uh, normally. Uh, we uh, we do not uh, do it in a, an auditorium setting, uh, so we try to do it uh, on a smaller scale, um, under thirty kids usually. Mm. Uh, we've had as small as uh, ten kids. Uh, we present the program in plain clothes, um, uh, not in uniform. Uh, that way they can feel like they can uh, interact with us and ask questions uh, without, you know, the, the uniform kind of uh, mm -hmm. the wow, wow factor of it, right? And where people get intimidated by it. Mm -hmm. uh, we do normally have, uh, not every time, but sometimes we will have uh, our, uh, our neighborhood officers or uh, if the primary response officers are available at the time, uh, have them sit in the back of the class um, and just kind of introduce themselves. Um, and then um, we present this program to them. We present the consequences and the dangers, case studies. Um, and then once, uh, once that is, uh, we're done with, the, with them for the day, they, we give them our contact information. So we're, uh, we're sort of their resource on, um, on getting things, uh, if they have questions uh, driving related, right? Mm. Uh, they can call us, uh, they, we give them our emails, mm. our, uh, our cell phone numbers, um, the, uh, the Right Track Racing Instagram uh, and the Facebook uh, social media we got set up. So uh, I want to be known as a resource yep. that people can. Sorry, we want to be a resource. So if people have questions, like I know when I was younger building a car, I had a ton of questions and nobody asked. Mm. So what we're offering is, you know, we're just a phone call or an email or whatever way. We're, we're there to answer your questions. If we don't know the answer, we'll figure it out and get back to you. 
And what sort of response have you guys gotten? The response have, have been really, I, I, I'm actually floored on uh, how engaged uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, the, the youth are that we're dealing with. Um, it, it, you know, I, I always thought that we, when we, when I first started thinking about this program with Jack, we both uh, were kind of like, well, we have to talk to the, uh, the shop students because they're the ones that are going to be really into it. And that's true because, uh, you know, we've had uh, the last uh, couple we had with, uh, with the shop students at one of the high schools, um, they're in that class because they already like cars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the students actually even had a race car. Uh, he raced with his dad. Um, another student had a, you know, like a brand new, uh, fairly new Mustang that his dad bought for him, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, they're already into it. But then we also presented uh, our program to, um, uh, or, or I, I shouldn't say program, but the, the actual uh, presentation is not the program. Uh, mm -hmm. You can sign up for the program afterwards. Uh, but we actually presented to uh, a class, uh, which was a law class, um, and uh, there was uh, out of the 20 students, there was maybe two or three uh, boys and the rest of them were girls. Mm. Um, and they and they liked it. And uh, we actually had uh, somebody from that class. Uh, and, and, you know, to my my surprise and my ignorance, uh, we've had quite a few uh, girls that have been signing up for the program. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I don't know if they're actually into the fast cars themselves. It's very possible. Um, but uh, they might be maybe even hanging out with people that are doing that, that mm. stuff, right? Do you say that because like Not traditionally, so is it mostly boys that, that are street racing or into the fast cars? Yeah. So I always tell this, I, I, sorry, Jack. Oh, uh, sorry. Just to back up a bit. Um, the, the presentation also appeals to not just the people who are driving cars, but making that choice, whether to get in as a passenger to somebody who's going to drive around recklessly. So I just wanted to add that little bit. In. No, no, no. That's, that's actually really valid. And I let me pick up on that now, and then we'll go back to the other stuff. But I wanted to ask you because Blaze had been telling me earlier uh, in our phone call earlier about some of the video content that you guys have in there as sort of a wake up call and about the fact that you will have, you know, school administrators say, can you mention this specific crash that happened X number of years ago to sort of drive it home? And I, and I said to you, Blaze, like, there's got to be examples from like every school that you go to of, mm -hmm. you know, in every neighborhood where where there have been, you know, serious life altering or fatal consequences from this sort of behavior. So um, can you just sort of walk me through that sort of stuff that you tell the kids about and, and what reaction you get from them? And if, if you see any minds actually being changed as a result, either one of yeah, you, there's guys. no shortage of, there's no shortage of examples to use. Um, uh, but we, I like to have a personal connection to each one of the stories. Either it's, you know, kids that went to the same school as the person who was hurt, or in one of our big ones was, uh, was a story where Blaze was one of the first officers on scene of a fatal crash. Mm -hmm. talk about that. Um, so the, the crash actually happened on January 13th, and I was uh, the first officer on scene with, uh, with another officer called Dave Sawyer. And uh, Dave and I walked up to the car, and uh, if you can imagine the, the carnage, this car went from uh, 126 kilometers an hour to zero instantly. Um, oh. The only thing that was left of it was uh, was sheet metal that was wrapped around the pole. Oh. Uh, the pole never moved, and uh, any content within that vehicle was inside uh, the backyards. Uh, mm -hmm. And 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 I so that's that's one of the ones uh, we talk about on our uh, on our uh, presentation. And then we went as far as uh, uh, we went and got, we got a hold of the, the parents and uh, we, we interviewed the parents on how it affected them and how it affected their families. Mm. Um, so we kind of tell them that, that story because, you know, as much as uh, I, 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 Sean, uh, it, the, the driver's name was Sean and uh, he was, he was racing his friend. And uh, they lost, one, or they both lost control. His friend was arrested, charged with criminal negligence, causing death. Um, Sean, uh, it cost him his life. But then 
on top of that, his entire family was uh, affected and mm -hmm. his friends and colleagues and everybody else around him. Um, but then I always take it to another level with the kids is not only was everybody that knew Sean affected, the first responders were, were uh, mm -hmm. affected. Um, and uh, when I walked up to the car, um, it, it was very clear that it was, it was unsurvivable, right? The, the collision. Um, but the EMS uh, crew that walked up with us, um, they both uh, were fairly new, um, fairly young, uh, less than a year on. And I remember they shot on, uh, on the uh, EMS uh, personnel's face. And, they, and, and he looked at me and I'll remember, I'll never forget what he said. And he said, he says, what do you think happened? And, and, I, and I know what happened, speed. Because it's usually the, the common denominators is, is speed. Right, it was uh, it was unsurvivable in that situation with that car. Right, mm -hmm. um, so we usually take it to a, a whole another level, and then I I show them a, a, an accident where a race car hits the wall uh, at 200 kilometers an hour, and uh, one of the examples we use is uh, is my friend there uh, who who races professionally in the in the states now, and uh, he hit that wall at 200 kilometers an hour, and I always explain to the kids I said I built race cars for years. I know what's inside of these cars and what kind of safety features they're using. Um, the difference between you driving your mom's caravan and being in this race car is nowhere near the same. Um, you know, uh, my friend Eric hit that wall at 200 kilometers or over 200 kilometers an hour and uh, he walked away with a sprained wrist, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I, I kind of explained that to them because, you know, sometimes you can, you can sit there and watch uh, racing uh, you know, we watch NASCAR and you see these cars tumbling out of control and the guy jumps out of it and walks away but with your regular car. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that's one of the things we get into. And, and then uh, we had one of our local uh, high schools that actually gave us uh, um, the teachers came up to us and said, we had a fatality here. Can you look into it? And uh, it was quite old, but very, uh, very relevant. Uh, so uh, the story is, is uh, it happened 20 years ago. Two, uh, two students, grade 12s, are driving their parents' car. They leave the school, start racing across Ellesmere, Scarborough, and um, one of them loses control. And there's a third student walking on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and the kid that loses control uh, crushes this student walking on the sidewalk against the pole, and he dies. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where I get in, uh, where I get into it, where they were all buddies. All three of them were friends um, and they essentially killed their friend. And now they have to live with it for the rest of their lives. And I've looked into both uh, people that were involved. They were both charged with criminal negligence causing death. Um, <clears throat> but they, I, I've looked at both of them and they have had no contact with the police since. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but I'm sure they still live with that every day. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the ones where the teachers came up to us and said, hey, can you can you look into this? And and uh, it was so old and um, I could barely uh, find anything in our we've we've changed systems multiple times. So it's mm -hmm. a you know, it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy that's been brought over. So everything was there, but except for the story. And uh, and I actually um, by sheer luck, I found uh, one of the officers uh, names on the bottom who I worked with. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past. And I reached out to him and I said, you know, uh, it would, Jeff, I said, uh, tell me about this collision. And here we are 20 years later. And, uh, and he remembers it like it's yesterday. Really? Right. So this is where I tell the, uh, this is where I tell the, uh, the, the kids that it's, it's not uh, the, the big picture on how many people it's affected is, uh, it is, mm -hmm. you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I can't even fathom the thought of, of how many people uh, one uh, one accident like that affects. Mm -hmm. right? So and when and when you're referring to that case, um, you said that those those two guys, they haven't had any contacts with the police since like not even a speeding ticket. I no. Or could you no, I haven't seen anything, actually. Wow. So, and That's I don't know, something. maybe they could be they, they, they potentially could be. Um, uh, you know, suspended drivers for life. I don't know what, mm. the, what the convictions were, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't seen um, for either party. I, I never saw anything. 
um, mm-hmm. as far as uh, you know where they were in trouble with the police mm-hmm. or um, or driving related offenses or collisions or anything like that. I did not see anything for them. Blaze, you uh, the video. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. The, the, the video that we show interviewing the parents, uh, Sean's parents, the one who passed away, I found that to be really impactful. And the emotion in their voices really drives home with the, the people watching the video um, and making the point that it's not just about you. It's, it's about your family. If you were to, to get hurt or you know, get killed street racing, it affects your family. And that video really, you know, highlights the effect that it has on other people. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean's it, father, for instance, has, yeah. Sean's father has never been able to go to the, the scene of that accident. He's never seen it on TV. He's never seen the area. He does not want to see it. He cannot look at it. Right. Mm. This, it's interesting to hear you guys use the word accident because I've heard a lot of police officers and, you know, survivors of these crashes, they don't like that word because they say, if you're choosing to race or if you're choosing to drink and drive, you're choosing to, you know, drive well under the influence of drugs or, or distracted driving, that that's a choice and it's not an accident. It's a collision. Are you like conscious of that or? You're, you're right. We, we should stop using that word. It's not an accident. It's an on purpose. Mm-hmm. Right. And, I, and, and I, I, I always say, uh, I tell the kids all the time, um, racing cars, um, uh, and you're essentially, um, you're, con- you're trying to control something that's out of control. Okay. Um, it, it's, it can change in an instant. Um, when, uh, when my friend Eric crashed, uh, he didn't know it was coming, right? He thought he was going to have a great weekend and it was the first uh, pass that he made off of the trailer. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you it it can happen with simple mechanical failure and uh and you think you're going to control that car and and it's and you're out of control right Mm. and it's too late you know um when you were telling that story like you just mentioned your friend the difference between race cars and like civilian cars for lack of a better term um it it brings me back to a case i like i covered countless traffic fatalities when I was a reporter in Toronto. And one of the ones that comes to mind is uh, this, I think he was 17 years old and his parents had just gotten him this car and they bought this car. I think it was actually like an SUV. They bought it because it had these roll bars. And so they thought it would, that would save him, you know, like it's got these safety features that's going to save him, but he was going so fast And he hit something and basically his car was going so fast that it went flying into an overpass that was where where he was and basically just sheared off the top of it. And it was another one of those unsurvivable things. And I remember his parents like talking to me and saying, you know, like, but it had the roll bars. Like we thought that he would be safe and maybe he thought that he would be safe and just felt invincible because Teenagers often feel invincible, whether it's driving or whatever. Um, And it just, that's one of those cases that just stuck with me because it's like, you know, you can put all these precautions in place, but if you don't have all of the, all of the things, like you're not on a racetrack or you're not actually in a racing car or, you know, what have you, then you you can't think that it's going to be safe. I wanted to ask you though, Blaze, because you touched on the, like the, the impact that this has on first responders. And you mentioned the, the paramedics that, that uh, had responded to that. That's one case that you were referring to. I wonder though, for you, if you're comfortable talking about it, being a car guy, being somebody that used to race illegally, like street racing, and who's now trying to stop that. What is it like for you responding to a crash like that? And, and knowing that it was speed that was behind it. It's certainly not ever easy and never, and those kind of collisions are, are never easy. Um, but, uh, for me, it just drives home the, uh, the importance of our, uh, of our program that we're trying to, um, uh, trying to run here. And, um, you know, if I can, if I can help one one youth not do that or uh, 
one one person to say you know what uh, to their friends say you're driving way too fast i'm getting out of the car right um i've already done my job uh, and in another i'll tell you a, a quick example and one of the things that i've been kind of dreaming about is uh, once we have a few people that are really into this stuff um there's a there's a program down in the u.s uh, they run out of uh, they, they go all over the u.s but it's, it's called breaks and i forget what the acronym stands for and uh this they're kind of um they're kind of a program that like like ourselves uh with the right track racing thing uh where uh, the guy that founded the program he actually lost uh, both his sons in the same accident, mm. right? So they were speeding across a highway and doing silly stuff, and uh, and his and both his kids uh, died in a, in a in a collision. Um, and he put this program on from from that. So one of the things that I I've always thought about is is how how great would it be if I could uh, you know get a get a few kids and and send them down to this uh, to this driving. And, uh, but the driving course is very interesting. And the reason I find it interesting is, is they don't just uh, put kids into a car and say, hey, okay, we're gonna show you this and how to drive defensively and what have you. So they actually do that part. They teach them how to drive on the road and defensively. But then they actually, the first day of the program, they actually take the parents mm -hmm. and they have a separate program for the parents, right? Mm -hmm. On what the indicators are that you should be looking for. Like myself, right? Where I was 18, 19 years old, out street racing and my parents had no idea mm. right so uh, what are those indicators so what, what 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 might your parents have been able to notice had they had somebody had this conversation with them the the car culture right um if you if you see your your son or daughter is into um, um uh, these these cars that are to you know, have modifications on them, uh, you know, different rims, uh, the, the big mufflers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a Civic or, uh, or a Chevy Camaro or a Mustang, what have you, right? It, it doesn't matter. Um, if you see that that is going that way, uh, perhaps it's, uh, it's time to have a conversation, right? And, um, and maybe they, mom and dad, uh, see us on social media somewhere and, uh, and they can get a hold of us. Mm -hmm. um, because we love to work with those uh, those people that are that are into into the same thing that we're into, essentially, mm -hmm. right? You you mentioned that when you go into the high schools, like you go in plain clothes, like like you are right now, because you're trying to get rid of that barrier that some people might have to the uniform. Is it difficult still, like going in as police officers to to connect with these kids at first? Do you feel a barrier when you go up, and and also like where do you think that comes from? I think the first time we did it, I felt kind of like we're the police and you're the kids. But after the first one, you know, after the first one went really smoothly, then it was all very smooth after that. Felt right at home. So this is where we listen to the, uh, this is where we listen to the teachers actually. Um, and one of the things that we, uh, we, uh, I mean, they do this day in and day out. We're we're not teachers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they uh, they suggested to us that we get a Kahoot account, right? So what a what a what, a what account? We, it, a Kahoot account. Uh, that's exact. That was exactly my reaction when I uh, when I when they said that to me. So what this Kahoot account is is uh, it's games essentially for the kids. So uh, you go on. I go online. Um, when we get there, uh, Jeff fires up the computer. He's the he's the tech guy. Um, so we put the Kahoot uh, link onto the uh, onto the projector, and the, uh, the the kids go on to their iPhones, uh, whatever phones they have, and they sign into that game, right? And then once we have uh, the the students that want to participate in the uh, in the game we start the game and uh you know at the end of it there's a uh first second third place right uh so there it's a competition right it's based on how fast you answered the questions and uh and if you got it right obviously and um so sometimes we have like 20 people on this thing 15 20 people uh or we can do it as a group setting as well where there's different teams mm -hmm. right 
and, uh, and then there's there's fun things in there as well so there's there's questions in there like you know if you get pulled over by a police officer uh, what uh, what documents do you need to give them right uh, but then and, uh, there's also uh, uh, fun fact things about uh, about Jeff and I right uh, one of them uh, we put in there was uh, who's had more collisions blaze or Jeff right and uh, and the answer is is I, I've had more accidents than Jeff right mm-hmm. um, it's just a fun icebreaker, but it really does lighten the mood. Mm-hmm. The kids are smiling and more engaged. So. And be That's honest, do you, do you guys play Kahoot at home? Like in your own time, do you find yourself like going on the phone and are you no, into it no, now? No, no. <laughs> but, but we, uh, but I have, uh, I have turned it on for, uh, for friends and family. Okay. Uh, just for, just for fun. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, they, they've, they've enjoyed it. Right. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Yes. Jeff, you look like you were about to say something. Um, no, no, so. no more interest in <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> Um, You mentioned, well, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure if it's a game that you could play by yourself. But yeah. Okay. I don't, but anyways. like I said, I don't even know what Kahoot is. <laughs> I got to look it up after this conversation. So we essentially made up a, um, an exam essentially mm-hmm. like uh, a, a multiple choice questions uh, or true or false mm. um, I, I think it only has 16 questions it takes us maybe five minutes to get through the whole thing mm. um, and we have a good time with it because uh, um, you know there's all kinds of uh, as, there's probably about five or six uh, serious questions questions mm. um, based on driving and then the rest of them are uh, are, are fun stuff right so you said like near the beginning of this conversation, Blaze, that, you know, you want to, part of this program is obviously that you want to keep kids from street racing. You want to get them on the right track, but you also said a big part of it is making that connection with the community. So maybe you guys can speak a little bit to that. Like why as police officers, as human beings, Blaze, as somebody that grew up in in Malvern, in Four District, where you've been policing your entire career, why, why is that so important? Building those relationships with these teenagers. So, why it's important to me, and uh, and, and being full frank here, uh, it's it's giving it's given me a um, a new spring in my step on it type of thing. Uh, where I have uh, a purpose, right? And, uh, and it's, and I enjoy working with the community and I enjoy working with, uh, with people that I serve as much as uh, the people that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I've been around my whole life, right? So, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to get, uh, to get this disgruntled in policing, right? Um, because you go out and you deal with, uh, with that half a percent of the public that, uh, that, you know, you see them in their worst moments. Right. And, uh, and you think, oh, everybody's like that. Right. Uh, and, and I, and I've been there, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I've been there and this is giving me, giving me a new purpose, um, with, uh, with policing. So it's incorporated my, my passion, um, it's incorporated uh, my life uh, with my career, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, with my career that I've that I've always uh, I've always loved, right? Um, it's so, inter- it's interesting you know, to hear. You, it's interesting to hear you mention that you know you've been there, like the disgruntled, where you're only seeing the negative, and you start to think that's that's everybody. Because I was talking to another officer uh, in another division the other day. And he was telling me about his time as a neighborhood officer in one of the high priority neighborhoods. And this was at the very beginning of the neighborhood officer program. And he said, when he went into this community, uh, there was a mutual distrust. The police or the, the community didn't trust the police and the police didn't trust the community because both sides were only seeing each other at the worst, you know, like the, the community was only seeing police when they were responding to the negative stuff that was happening in the community. And the police were only seeing the crime in the community because that's what they were responding to. But once they got the neighborhood officer program going, 
this officer was going in and seeing people as they were getting home from work, as they were cutting their lawn, as they were actually chatting, they were sharing meals together. And he said that like, like, it was really interesting because I'd never, I'd never thought about that perspective. I always thought about how valuable it is to have programs like that and like this, because it benefits the community to be able to see police officers as, you know, in a, in a more positive light as, as the people that they, they are rather than the job that they're doing when they're responding to the negative calls. But that got me really thinking about that other side. And now you just got me thinking about that again. And I wonder like, if you would agree with that sentiment that doing this sort of work, that it, it helps build trust, not only with the kids, but it has you guys looking at the community in a different way too. having done like, you know, like I said, primary response at the beginning and Jeff, I don't know, are you primary response as well? Yeah. Yeah. So you're going, you're going, you're going to negative thing after negative thing after negative thing. It's very Mm -hmm. rare that you're, that you guys are called to get the kitten out of the tree. That's the firefighters that get to deal with that stuff. But has this (laughs) helped you guys? Um, Has this helped you guys too? Because it's, it's, it's got to be really tough. All the negative stuff that you're exposed to all the time. Yeah, for sure. This is new policing. This is the, the future of policing, right? to be a familiar face instead of just a random person that comes uh, when you call 911 every once in a while. So yeah, like we want the message out there that not all police are out there hammering the public with tickets, you know? Some will do that and some are there as a resource to ask questions, our doors open, you know, you can reach out to us at any time. So there's the, the relationship building. We want to get to know the kids with the cars or anybody with the car, really, as far as this program goes anyway. Why is that? And so, why? And, and we've sort of, we've touched on it. This has been a sort of a theme throughout the conversation, but just drive home the point for me. Why is that so important? Why can't you just be there for the, the bad stuff and handing out the tickets, the enforcement? Why do you need to be proactive in this way? Well, I think the, the, the public sees you in a different light. Right. Um, and, and what do you get from I think that? There's increased what's, trust. what's the result? Yeah. And why is that trust important? Um, well, it, it goes both ways, right? I mean, the people, if you call 911, you want to, and you call police to, to help you, you need to be able to trust that police officer, right? And if, if all you've had is hard interactions with police, and maybe some are, you know, good and some are bad, then maybe your trust isn't 100%. But if you've had lots of soft interactions with police officers and you have a, a relationship, then I think uh, you're, you're more likely to trust the police officer. When something bad happens, then they people feel more when comfortable getting the help happens, they need. Yeah. yeah. More comfortable, yeah. Yeah. Blaze, did you want to jump in on that? Um, so... I, sorry, I don't know. I don't know what you want me to. Uh, what would the question was again here? Ba- basically, I'm, I'm, basically, just be, one yeah. thing. One thing I'll, I'll be uh, honest about here is that I'm usually five steps ahead of everybody. That's how my brain works. Um, so, so where, where are you right now? Things that I need to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So first, just tell me though why you think it's so important that that there is that trust already established. Why can't you just be the enforcer of rules? Why why should it be a police officer? going into these schools doing this rather than a race car driver, like an, a, another race car driver, somebody who's not a police officer. So one of the things I always tell people um, that I that I serve is I don't live in your community. Um, I don't, I police your community. I We can't be everywhere at, all the time. Um, so if, if we can build that bridge between that community and us, okay, then we will have an easier part policing it, mm-hmm. okay? Because you're living it and you're able to give me that knowledge of what is happening in that area, what the problems are and what, what the good and the bads are, right? And what we can help you with, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think that is the, the, the important part between building that, that trust, because, um, and I always, I always tell people the story of when I was, uh, when I was young, I went to, uh, I went to, uh, Europe 
um, and my brother and I got pulled over. Uh, I was driving, and over there they have very strict rules uh, on how many people can be in a vehicle. It, it'll say right on the permit, four people mm -hmm. maximum, no more, right? And I had five people in a car, and I got pulled over. And, uh, and I remember being pulled over and the officer told me uh, that, uh, that the, the fine for, you know, say it was $50, right? But he can work it out for 25, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, I, and I laughed because I'm sitting there, I'm like, it's $25. I'm just going to give him the $25 and I'm not getting a ticket, right? Um, however, my brother who lived there, um, the moment we drove away, he was losing his mind mm. and I'm, and I'm sitting there going, why is he so upset? It didn't affect me because I didn't live there. Right. It affected him. And, uh, and he's, he's sitting there. Uh, and I don't remember the exact amount that I, I gave him or how much it was. Um, uh, but I, I remember my brother saying, well, he says, that's a half a day's wage for somebody here. Mm. And, uh, and he just put it in his pocket. Right. And, uh, and, you know, the, the damage that that did uh, between um, my brother and, and that police service, right, was huge, right? And, you know, thank God I've never seen that here. I've never in my career, in uh, almost 17 years, I've never witnessed anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I should hope uh, it, it doesn't go on. Um, but uh, that is why it's important because, you know, you, we can sit here and build bridges, um, Till the cows come home um but one uh, one bad example uh it makes things worse uh, mm -hmm. we take 10 steps back right we've taken you know three steps forward and we take 10 steps back because one bad thing yeah right? I, I, and, I, I always... and unfortunately you know there's a there's a lot of us um and we make mistakes right um not you know to that magnitude that i was talking about uh, there's a there's a lot of us and, and, and the mistakes do happen um but uh in my eyes, the, the, the officers that I work with, uh, they're, uh, they're not out there to uh, harm a anyone, right? Uh, they want to deal with, deal with the call that they're dealing with and, and, and you know, help in that and move on to the next one, right? But uh, it, when I'm there for 20 minutes, I can't work out the problems that have arised in 10 years, right? Mm. Um, but the community can help me with that problem that arised in 10 years because they live that problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why that, that's why I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So right track racing, you guys go into the schools, you give your spiel, your power, your beautiful, amazingly put together PowerPoint presentation and share your stories. You do the Kahoot. Um, and then you said you give out your number, email address, people can get a hold of you. Are you actually hoping to take the kids to the track at some point, or have you done that yet? Is that going to be part of the program, do you think? We got lots of things in the works. We haven't had our first official uh, event yet, but we got lots of ideas. And yes, that is absolutely part of the program coming up. We want to get some youth or anyone really who's really into this. And we're going to go to the track. We're going to, we got lots of ideas. So Wow. That's really cool. How do you guys have time for this? Because you are both primary response officers. Um, Blaze, I think that you just worked an overnight shift last night, right? So I, I think you're both I doing, did, yes. you're having this conversation on your own time right now, right? How do you have time for this program when you're working full time as police officers? It's not going to be easy, but we're dedicated to this and passionate about it. So we're going to make it work one way or the other. One thing, uh, one thing. About me is uh, as much as I'm very busy. Um, I uh, once I get my once I lock onto something, I I'm like a pit bull. I won't let go. Uh, so I uh, I am uh, I am passionate about this, and uh, and I'll make the time. Is the is the way it uh, is is going and will go. And it, it, from the beginning, uh, I put a lot of uh, my own time into it, mm -hmm. uh, which. Uh, I, I just, for me, it, it really incorporates everything that I, that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. You're passionate about policing. You're passionate about cars. What better 
what be better union could you guys come up with? I think it's awesome. And I think it's important for the public to realize too, that so much of this stuff, like so many other programs that I'm highlighting and police officers, like little things that they do in the communities, it's done on their own time, whether it is answering that cell phone call or that email or taking the kids to the track. Cause I can't imagine that you're going to get any calls out at the racetrack that are going to take you there and, and be able to take the kids there. But, uh, I just think it's, it's awesome. What you guys are doing is, is there anything else that you want now that your brain is five steps ahead, blaze, anything else that we haven't <laughs> talked about that you want well, to one get of the, One of the things that I, that I, my brain is five steps ahead on right now is, uh, we're working together with, uh, Toronto Motorsports Park, mm. which is located in Cuba down by Hamilton way. Mm -hmm. Um, they have been, a, a major uh, supporter of this program right from the beginning mm. uh, when uh, when we were locked down for COVID and everything else um, and uh, and right after this uh, we have a conference call actually with uh, with their social media person mm. um, because they want to take it to the next level awesome um, so they're uh, they I actually talked to the owner the other day uh, Uli and uh, Uli told us the other day that uh, I asked him I said I'd like to bring about maybe six to eight uh, youth down for the first uh, first run and uh, and his answer was uh, bring six bring 30 bring 50 bring as many as you want right Amazing. and he's actually offered to uh, to let the uh, let everyone in for free right wow. and, and when i said to him i said you know i said i and, you know for him you have to remember it's still a, a business he has to stay in business right so um I, I asked him, I said, what day would you like us to bring uh, the kids? Like, which weekend? And uh, I said, I know your big weekend is uh, July 1st. Uh, they have their, um, um, their big race on, uh, on the Canada Day long weekend. And, uh, and I, said, I, I said, maybe we'll come on another day. And he said, no, he says, uh, you bring them on whichever day you would like to bring them. All right. Yeah. So, um, you know, and it's, and it's quite expensive to get into these things, uh, the actual races. Um, I, as much as it's affordable to take your car there on a Friday night, it's $30, $40, right? Um, but, uh, but he's willing to, uh, to let the kids in to spectate without, uh, without any issues. Wow. And so, and so many kids. That's incredible. I love hearing about these partnerships that police officers find. And I have one more question then. Uh, will this program be confined to 43 division or do you expect to be working with kids throughout the city? So I, I hope, uh, and I, I can hope I can speak for Jeff here too. I hope to take it uh, outside of 43 division. Um, certainly take it uh, to the, to four district at first, and then we'll see where it goes. Um, what we're hoping for is uh and, and, and email is about to go out at, at our division. I'm going to be sending out this week um, to the entire station is uh, in for them to bring in their kids, right? The, the youth from the, our station, we're going to run, uh, we're going to show the PowerPoint, but the, but the point behind it is, as uh, you know, there's a, a double uh, thing for us. And for me uh, now I can run the PowerPoint show the uh show the youth from uh you know the the, the children of, uh, of the officers, officers yeah right and then the officers can sit in the room and say this is what they're doing right mm -hmm. um and then when they get a call then when those officers get a call at the high schools and they're talking to the principals or talking to the teachers um they can mention that we have a program for this awesome right? and it's not an issue now uh, in in scarborough but um but Jeff and I are only two people. We can't be at every high school at all times, right? So uh, what I'm hoping for is that down the road, um, you know, we can just have uh, appointments where uh, Jeff and I come in and present um, because that's one thing that I'm kind of adamant about is uh, that uh, and the, the, the PowerPoint, the program is kind of our story. Um, and it's, it would be very hard for somebody else to deliver it with the same, uh, with the same message. Of course. Um, so, you know, so we look forward to working with other, possibly even other agencies, right? Um, we'll see where it goes. Uh, uh, our, uh, our bosses at uh, 43 Division um, right now is, uh, is uh, in Inspector Caracciolo. He's, uh, he's the, actually the uh, acting unit commander, superintendent. 
Um, and then we have uh, Dave Rizek, who's, uh, who's the um, acting um, staff superintendent with the Toronto Police. Um, they, uh, I mean, Dave Rizek uh, has been uh, an, an avid supporter of this program from the, from day one. When when um, I, I went in his office and, and sat down there with with him and, and, and mm-hmm. the three of us with Jeff, and uh, and we didn't know what to do or how to do it or how to put it on paper, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he kind of mentored us through that part of it, right? And uh, and, and here we are. But um, but for instance, uh, in, uh, acting superintendent uh, Caracciolo, um, when he was asked, uh, he said that uh, I'll, at this point I'll let these guys go anyway. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, uh, and and I'm sure a lot of it is going to be on our own time, mm-hmm. right? Um, which is fine because uh, because we're that uh, we're that involved, we're that passionate mm-hmm. about it. So mm-hmm. where can people find out more about you? Where you mentioned your socials? Where can people find you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well the the instagram is at right track racing and blaze has a facebook um is it rtr yeah right it's, track uh, racing? it's right track racing slash rtr you can find it by just right track mm-hmm. um right track racing um we jeff kind of said that wrong we, we kind of took i took facebook he took instagram because it's uh it's quite a bit of work Right, but they're linked. They're uh, they're one account. Essentially. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's just that uh, when Facebook goes off, it buzzes my phone. When Instagram goes off, it buzzes. <laughs> nice. Good. Are you guys going racing this weekend, or in the days to come? Any plans? So, I I'm um, I'm going to uh, I'm not racing as of right now. Um, so that's another thing I need to mention um, on uh, on Saturday night tomorrow night. I'm going to uh, Cayuga uh, down to Toronto Motorsports. I, they actually have a program on Saturday nights every so often where uh, they shut the top end of the track down mm-hmm. and they simulate like um, almost like a street race, mm-hmm. but it's organized and it's in a controlled environment. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they're, they're running that tomorrow and, uh, and the owner of the track uh, has, has asked mm-hmm. us to come. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to try to make my first TikTok video tomorrow. Oh, uh, exciting. My son's going to help me on that. Um, so we're going to all be there tomorrow night. Unfortunately, Jeff has plans, so he can't make it. Um, and then uh, the other thing that's coming is uh, I'm building a race car. Okay. okay. What are you building? Uh, and like, what is involved in building? I said like five minutes ago, I was asking you the last question, but I keep getting interested in things you're saying. <laughs> What's it? Are you building it from scratch? Are you taking like a normal car and just adding, you know, souping it up to make it raceable? So uh, yes, I am building it from scratch. Um, so I used to work for a place called Phoenix Performance, mm-hmm. uh, we, where we built drag cars, all the chassis work and, and frames and uh, roll cages and what have you. So that is being done right now. Um, I'm adamant that I am doing all of it. Um, it's almost complete as far as the chassis work. The reason, and I don't have time to do it, uh, so it's taken a little bit longer than it should have, obviously. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of money invested in it. Oh my right? goodness! Um, but like I said, that part of it I don't care about because it's it's it is my passions and I and I like it. And I'm hoping that uh, that next year uh, that car will be ready, and we're gonna race that car as a part of this program. Wow! And, uh, and I know um, Jeff was talking to um, to the social media person from the racetrack. And uh, they're hoping that we can do like a track day together, mm. right? Um, where uh, where our car is involved, and then Ulan Racing has been talking uh, to us, um, so they're hoping that we can get together and uh, and do like a race with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have race cars that kind of look like uh, um, police cars, essentially, mm-hmm. right? Um, so uh, we're gonna try to do our car the same way. They're about 25 years ahead of us. Yeah, they have like, big trailers and everything. So. Like years ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> they have race cars that look like police cars? That's just like a gimmick or what? Um, it, I, it's, it's a fun thing for me. I, I mean, uh, you know, as, they, as much as they're race cars and they race them, 
um, they are, they're also using them for community events, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that's uh, that's my um, that's my hope for it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, where uh, you know we kind of just pull the car in, um, uh, and uh, and we put up a, a barrier, put up a booth, and, and at these community events we can set up uh, uh, you know right track racing and and uh, tell them our stories and, uh, and tell them they can sign up. You got to send me a p- some pictures. Blaze, if you're willing to share your work in progress, or once you get to a point that you're willing to share, I would love to be able to share that with, with what we're doing here, just to give people an idea of what is involved. Jeff, do you have any racing plans in your future? Um, yeah, I've had my car out once this year, and uh, it definitely won't be the last. Is it, a, is it like a, like when I'm picturing your car, is it uh like what does it look like and does it look like a racing car that you'd see in like the formula one or is it no no it's just it's just an old classic uh, american muscle car it's uh-huh. a street car and just once in a while I'll take it to the track and uh, just for fun awesome the race take car it to is the track. Love it. exactly <laughs> you can put around town go for ice cream uh, on the street and then uh, once in a while I'll take it to the track and uh, have some fun awesome what were you going to say blaze the, the race car is a different story. It's a 2007 Mustang. And um, as much as it looks like the actual car from the outside, um, it's got, if you look inside of it, there is roll cage and everything else all over the place. Um, awesome. You know, very minimal interior. The entire rear section of the car has been cut out mm-hmm. and, uh, and replaced with, uh, with racing suspension and, and, you know, just bars and tubes. Uh, to the average person uh, going everywhere, but but, uh, but they're to they're there to uh, to save me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I I love your story, you guys. I love how you were serendipitously brought together at forty three division. Like, what are the chances? Is and on the same platoon rider, were you guys actually partners at one point? Like in community response, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like, what are what are the chances? Response. What are the chances? I I love that. And it's not the first story I've come across like that, where just by, you know, chance, two people with the same passions come together and something amazing happens. So I commend you on the work that you're doing. I'm so excited to see what happens with this program. Send me like some pictures like now or down the road and we'll keep spreading the word about this. So thanks so much, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. Have a great day. You too.